We are live. What is going on, everyone? How you guys all doing? I got a special guest for you guys today. Luke, where are you based out of again, man? I'm uh, in the Philadelphia area. Nice, nice. Well, I'm I'm Canadian. Hopefully, you like Canadians. I mean, yeah, uh, absolutely. I mean, <laughs> as long as you're a good person, I'm I'm here for it. Yeah, you know what? I I guess I'm a I guess I'm a good person. I mean, you know, Canadians usually have that uh, title. So, but um, this this interview is all going to be about you. I'm super excited. Um, the truth is, I've been following you since I was probably 20 years old, man, 21 years old, which is like pretty crazy. I remember seeing your YouTube videos back in the day, throwing it down at these live events, and I would get inspired when I would throw live events at my own house. Um, but mm-hmm. now it's you know, <laughs> what would you say? Appreciate that. Of course, man. Uh, you were big, big inspiration. And so now that we're both kind of in the coaching industry, it's kind of funny how life works. But I feel that, um, you know, uh, as I'm a big fan of the uh, of the, the coaching game, I think we've built our skills from uh, public speaking, from learning how to build sales teams, from knowing how to have a vision, um, knowing how to train and, and, and how to get people results. And so what I really want to talk about is um, your journey being in this game, what has kind of worked for you. I was I was looking at your website. And uh, from what I've seen, you spent $8.4 million on ads. So I would be, uh, I'd be crying if that was the case for me, but I'm, I'm, I'm getting there soon. And then, uh, you know, you've also uh, booked over 100,000 high ticket calls, man, which is which is ridiculous. Mm-hmm. And so, um, really what I want to hear from you, man, is if, you know, if you want to give any background on yourself, I'll prove you right now, any background on yourself of being in this coaching game and, um, and then we'll kind of get into some questions I got. Yeah, for sure. So, um, you know, I actually, um, when, you know, I wasn't really confident. I knew I could make money in, uh, in something on the internet, but I didn't want to be the face of it. I didn't actually want to be a coach. I wanted to find someone who had the expertise and, uh, build a business around them, which is what I did here. Um, and that's turned into now a, you know, eight figure business. And we have, you know, 50 coaches that we staff inside of the company that all have client rosters and it's all around, health and fitness coaching. Um, and yeah, that's going good. You know, um, it's a, it's a great business. I think people want help with things. And then if you're good at helping them, there's a lot of value in today's world in having a coach, like having someone to talk to, having someone to rely on, having someone to support you. Um, and I think that that's just going to continue to increase. Nice, man. And so I kind of want to go a little bit uh, before where you are right now. How did you get into this world? Like, how did you learn marketing? Like, obviously, I I feel like you're wired uh, for marketing at a young age. But how did you go more into the online space? And how did you learn the ad game? I want to hear I want to hear young Luke on a mission to figure out ads to figure out, you know, how do you actually, uh, you know, um, get a lead? nurture the lead and have someone, you know, take out their credit card and pay for a program. I, I want to hear about that journey. Yeah. Um, so I had a background in network marketing, you know, that's how we met. I did really good there, built a 65,000 person sales team. That company blew up. Um, and I basically had like an identity crisis or a period where I needed to like reinvent myself from the ground up and figure out what I was going to do. And uh, luckily I had some savings. So I sort of just lived off of savings and traveled for like three or four years, to be honest, Um, which was great. Um, And then I was like, all right, I I need to do something. Maybe it wasn't three or four years. It was, it was at least like two and a half years though. And, um, And I just started buying all of the courses that I could in that period of time. So like in that period of time, I was buying all of the internet courses I could find and, you know, everything I was buying ad stuff. I was buying SEO stuff. I was buying funnel stuff. I was buying copywriting stuff. I was buying consulting stuff. I was buying, I was buying everything I could. Um, And I was in a place where I was just willing to do anything. And then I had a lot of alone time. And so I just dug in and from there I got into like some e-commerce stuff did like, you know, built like a kitchen supply store and like a dog store. This is back in like 2016 and 17 when 
um, it was really easy to run ads on the internet and uh, anyone could kind of do it and had some quick success. And then um, ran into Nikki, who's my business partner and girlfriend. And I was like, wow, you look amazing. She was about to be uh, winning her like third bodybuilding competition. I was just fascinated with how proportionate she was because I had a background in, um, in fitness and like lifting and always loved that. And I was like, Hey, do you want to, you know, try and do something here? Basically helped her make like six figures. This once again was back when Facebook was super easy. I set up one ad. She paid me two grand one time. That thing ran for a year and she made like 80 or a hundred grand in coaching, uh, with like really, you know, unsophisticated marketing and unsophisticated, you know, everything. And then I reapproached her because I was doing the e-commerce stuff while this was happening and was like, hey, would you want to do this more seriously? And then we relinked up. We were trying to model Lady Boss, which was uh, Brandon yeah. and Kaylin Tolan uh, or Tool, Harry Paulin, their company. They were doing, you know, huge numbers. And so that's where the marketing, I think, kind of got figured out because I was, you know, e-commerce first, selling stuff on the Internet different niches, you know, learn the copywriting, <laughs> learned all that stuff. And then, um, pivoted, uh, the business model to a more coaching model, which was like e-learning one to many coaching for the first, like 2020, 2021. And then the market just wanted coaching more because these e-learning products came everywhere. And it was like, what's actually valuable to people now is not necessarily programs or coaching because it's just, or no, I'm sorry, not necessarily programs or information because they're everywhere, but they want the person, right? They want like the person that they can engage with. And so we just followed the market and then pivoted the business model where, you know, 70% of the 10 million, which was like 7,000 sales of a thousand dollar e-learning product in 20, 21, you know, flipped into 2022. And then in 2023, it'll be basically, you know, 95% one to one coaching. Crazy, crazy, man. Yeah, I feel like, uh, at least at least for myself, 2014 was definitely an identity crisis year. That was always a fun time. I mean, for myself, I went into door to door sales. So, nice. um, you know, Vima kind of went up, I have platinum. So I obviously didn't hit ambassador. Um, but I, I felt happy about that. I got my dad to co-sign on the BMW, which was always fun. Go. But then, uh, but then, uh, yeah, 20, 2015 is kind of when I went into door to door sales and I did that for about five years. So I started off as a rep, became a manager and I became a director. And then, you know, by 2019, you know, I think my, whatever, my biggest year was 250 grand in income. And then, Amazing. uh, yeah. And then, well, as a door to door sales rep on commission and overrides. Right. So I was, I was pretty happy about that. Oh yeah. And then COVID and then COVID hit and like, I am uh, obviously my project I put on pause and I'm like, I want to go into the online space. And all I knew is I grew up with a speaking issue and I thought, Hey, I wonder if I could um, help people with speech because speech therapy didn't work for me more. Of the public speaking in Vima actually was one of the reasons why I was able to overcome it. Um, and so I took that, I took that hypothesis. I built a, a community. And then before I knew it, I was selling at a low ticket rate for a six week course. Um, and then I, I increased, I, I increased the rate to 2,500, 4,000, $5,000, $7,500 for a high ticket speaking program, which, which was, which is pretty cool. So I, I, I love your journey because I feel like we all kind of went through this identity crisis, but you've been in the game for a little bit, man. Um, which is awesome, which is like, which is, which is cray cray. And so, um, what I want to ask you is one, uh, like a lot of, um, a lot of the uh, audience in this group are, I would say, newer coaches trying to get their foot in the ground, uh, whether it's they're in the real estate niche, whether they're in the health niche, whether they're in the, the, the mindset niche. Um, from your point of view, um, what's the first thing most people should do to kind of Have get the skill set? So talk I, about I think, that. I think most people screw up with coaching because they try and coach before they have any validity anywhere. Um you know, I still don't actually coach, right? I just run this whole company. And then the people who coach health and fitness, they're all, you know, certified, you know, 10 year coaches and different specializations. And, you know, they can get people the result that they're looking for. You just said the speech thing, 
you know, you know, it's like, I think that's the elephant in the room in coaching that people miss, you know, they're like, Oh, I want to just be a coach and make money. It's like, okay, well, what are you coaching? Like, what do you know how to do? Well, you know, if you want to coach real estate, you better be fucking good at real estate because why the hell else would anybody want to listen to you? Right. If you want to coach speech, you better be really good at speech, right? You better be able to work people through figuring that out. So, you know, that's the elephant in the room is you shouldn't be a coach until you have something to coach on. And then you can't arbitrarily choose what you want to coach on, which I think people screw up on as well. It's like, oh, I'll just coach in this. It's like, you're not going to really do good because, you know, once again, you have to have the expertise and the skill set to merit the value of what it is that you're teaching or coaching on. So that would be my advice. It would be go get good at something and solve problems for yourself and in your life to a point where you feel confident, you know, publicly stating what it is that you're offering and for what price and are willing to stand your ground. Yeah. This is, this is, this is the Luke Kish I want, man. I want you to call some people out. <laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> Listen, True. we, we True. swear on these lives, baby. Just, just, uh, I want to hear the real Luke Kitsch. Don't give me yeah. the professional Luke Kitsch. Okay. So <laughs> yeah. Um, super cool, man. And so, so let's kind of talk about that. So I, you know, I think initially I want to talk about the newer coach and then we'll kind of get into more of the experienced coach. Like mm-hmm. I, I've, I've probably spent maybe three, 400 grand on ads and I've, I've, I've sold a high ticket, um, and so let's let's talk more to the beginner coach and then we'll kind of move up the ranking into someone who's who's maybe doing 20, 30, 40, 50 plus a month or 100 a month. So for the beginner coach, so let's say they're like, look, I want to coach. This is what I want to do. Uh, the answer goes, cool, build the skill set. Um, is there anything around there where someone can build the skill set? So for example, what I did was even though I'm a decent speaker and I have a background, I feel like one of the first things I had to do was at the coach group for free. And I, I'm a big fan of before you can get paid, um, do you have enough testimonials? Like when you have no testimonials, you, you, your ship's free, right? And so anything uh, from that nature of like, you know, like for example, we have uh, a time management mom, we have a someone who helps with addicts or we have someone who, sure, you could say, you know, is a fitness coach, but let's say they don't have any, they're beginning, they, they, they have the background or somewhat of a background or um, what's the first thing to really get like their feet in the ground? Um, like, would you recommend free coaching? Would you recommend, uh, creating some type of page? Like, what would you say to kind of like make it more of a reality? Like sometimes when we're, when we're in this game for a while, it's, um, you know, it's whatever. Right. So I think, like, a brand I think like starting, like, you know, don't start one remove. I think like you should begin with having the skill set yourself. Um, so once again, it's like, you can't arbitrarily decide what you're good at, right? It's like, you need to be able to self-observe yourself accurately and, you know, truthfully and assess, okay, I have proven to me that I can do or have done this thing. So here's something I feel like I can help other people to do. Um, at least that's the way I think about it. Um, And so I would start there first. And then once you get some sort of answer there, you can develop on it with other people for free. So, you know, I think it's like, don't be arbitrary, be objective, self-assess yourself accurately. What's the answer? Take the answer, whether you like the answer or not. If you don't like the answer, then you have to go back to square one and gain a new skill. Um, And then once you do like the answer or you have an answer you're okay with accepting, then you can go you know, delve in further and expound on it. But I think like, it's really key to understand like how good you are at the thing is like directly correlated with how successful you'll be as a coach. Cause people try and come into this thing and they're like, Oh yeah, I just, you know, I want to do this to make money. It's like, all right, well, you're not going to fucking make any money or any lasting (laughs) money if you're not any good. And if you do, you're a scumbag, right? It's like, you know, now you're just on the internet and you're another coach that's selling coaches on how to do coaching. And it's like, you know, that's just, um, that's just like a, a yucky, yucky, messy thing that you don't even want to be a part of, even if it does make you money, you know what I mean? So be accurate with yourself, go get the skill, you know, it might take a few years, but long-term it's the shortest path. And then, you know, once you have something, then you go and you, you, uh, you productize it, you know, you turn it into a, a real service with people and then you make money doing it. 
I love that. And if you guys are loving it down below, I know we got some people on live. Comment down below. If you guys have any questions for Lukesh, please, please, please ask. So let's kind of talk more about, um, you know, I, I, I feel like the ad game has changed. Like I've ran, uh, I'm running right now an instant form campaign. Um, I've run webinar campaigns. Uh, I've run ads to my Facebook group. Um, from your point of view in 2023 and where the future is going, um, you know, when it comes to a coaching program specifically, um, what are, what are, what is a good campaign? And then what do you feel like are the mistakes people make when running ads and where they, uh, maybe lose sales or, you know, I have a webinar or I have a, whatever, an instant form campaign and it's a DM campaign. Like, what do you think a, what are the best campaigns right now? And then B, where do you think people go wrong with running ads? Um, I think that, uh, you know, it's hard to say like, what's the best. I'm pretty sure people are successfully running every single kind of campaign that there is. So I, I feel like where people screw up is they don't just pick something. And then I think, you know, what most people don't understand about ads is that you need to have like the environment around the ads for the ads to work, you know? So like, if you're just running an ad and like, there's nothing else, right? Like in the digital world or whatever, or, you know, emails behind it and a team of people behind it and, you know, your sales team's properly trained or whatever, I don't know, you know, um, then the ads could be doing fine for the part of what they're supposed to be doing in the overall journey that a customer goes down from interacting to a piece of content and warming up and then, you know, booking a call, whatever it is. Um, so I think people screw up in two ways. One, they don't just focus and pick something to try and figure out. And then two, they don't look deep enough at the ecosystem around the ads um, because the ecosystem around the ads, I think is probably way more important than the ads themselves. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Like having some type of automation and making sure that the leads aren't falling through the cracks. hundred percent, hundred percent. Well, you know, in, in, in terms of yourself, um, cause I, 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 I have a team right now of five. And so I'm always looking at, uh, I'm, I'm learning right now. Like I've, I built sales team, like I had a 60, 70 person door to door sales team, but like building a businessman, different having like, I'm like marketing, you know, yeah. It, it, it's so funny, man. Back in the day, I thought sales is sales is everything. And then you go into business, you're like, no, no, no 80% of it is marketing <laughs> and 20% of it is sales. Um, but from your end, um, <clears throat> building a business, um, how did, like, what would you say your skill set is, like what you're good at? And then how did you find the right people around you to, like, uh, um, if anything like myself, like I'm, I'm sure you're an avid learner, you're constantly learning. So you're learning copywriting, you're learning ads, you're learning video content. I see your reels all the time, which which is awesome. Um, I see your branding. So it's like for you, as you, as you, as, as you're the CEO, like, is there something that like, this is what I'm doing. And then I'm, I'm hiring people around there. And then I'm training people. Like, how does a thought process for Luke Kish work of like, this is what I'm good at. I'm going to focus on this. I'm going to, I'm going to build around it. Yeah. Um, Cause yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So I think it starts with like accurate self-assessment. So it's like asking yourself, what are you good at? You know, for me, it's, I'm good at problem solving. I'm good at strategic thinking. I'm good at sales and marketing. And then I'm good at seeing like vision, right? Like here's where we should go. Um, and so, um, you know, then I just try and fill the holes. So it's like, all right, where am I stuck right now? Right? Like really common sense. Like where's necessity leading me? Like where's like pain leading me or where is there like an actual limitation? Or every time I go do this kind of work, it's, I'm bad at it. It takes me a lot of time and, you know, I, I need someone to help me here. And then you got to just find good people. Um, you know, I think people try and, you know, they're greedy. Um, they don't, want to let people take the upside. They don't want to overpay. You know, they want to find the cheapest guy they can find. And we've never operated like that. So everybody who's key in my company, revenue shares, profit shares, right? So they're all tied to driving the company forward. And it's all very substantial. You know, it's not like it's like, you know, these guys are making little amounts of money. And you got to think about it, like good people want big opportunity, right? There's no such thing as a great person filling a space that's a small opportunity, right? 
or, or they'll just leave, right? They'll be there for a couple of months and then they're out and they got to go find something bigger. So I think for me, it's been having like a big enough vision and belief of what I can build with people so that good people see themselves in a big role within the vision. And then me like compensating in alignment with that. You know, I think that's been the thing. If you can align the drivers and the self-interests of the humans who are working with you that are high level towards the greater good, then it's just a lot easier. That's solid. First off, I, I think I needed to hear that myself. Um, where are you finding these people? Um, recruiting them out of companies, um, finding um, like, you know, it depends on which role you know, um, lots and lots and lots of interviewing, you know, like, uh, that's where it started. Just tons and tons and tons of interview in a couple of them came from my personal brand or like people who've known me in the past. Um, you know, uh, one person grew from within who's really important, substantial. One person was recommended by an agency that I was working with because of kind of the vision that I had. And then the agency that I was working with, they were like, okay, we can't fulfill this. Here's this guy recommended him. Um, so really it's everywhere. I think before you have a brand though, it's like, you got to sacrifice um, whatever you need to, you know, it's like go on and indeed and interview volume. Right. And um, that's, I think where it begins. And then, you know, eventually, hopefully you have more, you know, holy kind of situation, but it's been all kinds, you know? Yeah. I'm, I'm finding the the biggest challenge that I'm facing is more of like the onboarding aspect of like onboarding someone solidly. Like I'm, 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 I'm learning how to do that in terms of yeah. like, do they have all the material that they need? What is the communications, um, you know, source or like, how are they reaching out to me? Um, and then I think it's, it's finding the right people from the beginning, but this is, I think this is the, one of the biggest challenges. Like as I, as I learned more about building businesses, I, I've, I've never built a business before. I've ran yeah. sales teams. And I think it's such well, a different I, game. But I think, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but like if you're hiring, like who are you talking about hiring and onboarding? Like yeah, who's so, your biggest hire right now? Like you're trying to find. Well, I think for myself, like I have an appointment setter um, and I have a, another part-time setter. So I have a full-time and then a part-time. Um, I have someone who's helped me with operations. Um, and then I have, and then I have a marketing team that's helped me Got more it. with the marketing aspect, but so, it's like, yeah, go ahead. So, so like, I think like this, like, I think like, I want to try and hire somebody who knows how to, how to do the thing so much better than I can do the thing that there's no way that I can even onboard them. Right. And then like from day one, I need to be like, look, I have no fucking clue how to do this correctly. You're going to be able to need to know how to do this correctly and figure it out. And like, is that you? Right. And that's for like any actual leadership position that should be okay. Right. Ideally, like our, you know, I mean, we have, I think, a hundred people on the team now, and we have hired probably 500 people, if I had to guess, over the last few years. And yeah. it took us, you know, up until six months ago, where it's like, unless it's a totally confined, understood role, then everyone we hire needs to come in knowing a bunch of things about what they're doing that we do not like without question, they need to know more about what they're doing than, than we do. Otherwise you have another job, right. And then you're kind of stuck. Like you need to get people who can think for themselves. You need to get people who can, you know, figure it out. Right. Like, and like already have figured, have it figured out. And when you hire one of those people, it's night and day. Like you're like, holy fuck, like this has been so goddamn hard for me for the last, you know, six months. And like, they came in in like three weeks, it's like all fixed. And like, you didn't even talk to them. And you're like, you know, thank you, Jesus. Like, you know, we want to find more people like this. So, so. I, I, I heard Hormozy talk about this in his $100 million leads book, uh, how he like, and so I'm, I'm curious to the way that you think. So the way he thinks he, he hires agencies first who are good at it. And then he'll understand how they do it. And then he'll bring an in-house team in and then model the behavior so they don't need the agency. They'll let the agency know up front. Because I find like everyone everyone can come to you and say, oh, I'm really good at marketing. I'm really good at copywriting. 
And so how was, how was your thought process work? Does your thought process work the same way? Or are you just hiring them, giving them a six figure salary or whatever that they want? Like, what is the thought process there for you? Yes. Um, well, it depends. Like certain roles aren't agency kinds of roles. So like if you're talking about like media buying or marketing or like a creative agency, I understand what you're, what, what he's saying there. Um, but like, you know, for example, like an ops person, like it'd be hard to have an agency doing ops inside your business, like internal ops. Um, yeah. So it depends on what the role is, but yeah, you know, like you want to be aware enough on like what the really important components of your business are to understand if someone's doing a good job or not right like media buying and marketing and stuff like that like you need to be able to in my opinion either you or somebody able to look because it's just too important of a skill set for an online business to not have it like at the leadership level understood to a degree where you can you know, make sure people are doing the right thing. And um, so, yeah, it's judgment, you know, all the really, really important ones, certainly. And then, you know, um, and then, yeah, you know, it's like you can model it. And I'm sure he's saying like, absolutely. But like, hypothetically, if he knew the whole agency was ran really good in this example, and then the guy who was running the agency was like, hey, I want to work for you right? Like he wouldn't have to question too much, right? Or like he wouldn't have to know too much because he would know that that agency was ran well and then that guy was running it. So he was able to run it. Solid. Solid. Yeah, yeah, for sure. When it comes to ops, it's a whole different game. He's specifically talking about how he grew from from social media and in terms of marketing and and, and media buying. So 100%. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So next question I want to ask you. So, So you would say, What's the percentage of your business when it comes to coaching? Would you say majority of it is coaching? Yeah, now that okay. now it is, yeah. Okay. So uh, from that, uh, I think a lot of people ask or basically go through this thought process of what's more important, organic or paid ads. And the truth is, you're you're, you're going to need both. Um, but from yourself, I'm, I'm sure you're a big numbers guy. Where would you say majority of your sales are coming from? Like, obviously, maybe paid. they're getting nurtured through organic, but they're coming from paid. So talk about that, because I think this is, is, is a big thing. A lot of people just doing organic forever and like being plateaued there. Yeah, for sure. Um, so I think like I don't look at them as different in their function, right? I look at like a paid view as you're paying for an impression on an ad platform to get the impression. And I look at organic as you're paying for the team that creates the content for the impressions. So at the end of the day, they're both just impressions. Um, and you can win with both of them. You know, eventually you're going to have both of them. If you take them to the extremes, organic done really, really well. Like if you have somebody who's like knees over toes guy or like Sonata Grace, you're Alex Hormozzi, you know, if you crack the the code on organic and you really have good stuff with re- that resonates with your audience and it gets spread, then it's way more cost effective from an impression standpoint than running paid ads. And then paid ads is, you know, uh, has its pro in that or its con is that it's more expensive, obviously, because you have to pay for the impressions to the platform. But the pro is when you create like a piece of content that, you know, uh, successfully accomplishes the specific function of like that impression, right? So like that piece of content's purpose, whether it be to, you know, get somebody to opt into something or, you know, whether it be to, you know, build belief by showing like testimonials at some point in the funnel, whatever, you can just pay to make sure that it gets seen. Uh, and then that's manufacturable. So like if you're scaling up your team, you're scaling up your sales team, your SDR team, whatever it is, when you can uh, predictably adjust the volume, it's better and easier to scale on until you have like a good base. Or if you're one of these people that has so much organic that you're just constantly trying to catch up with it then you're also in a good spot, but you don't want to be scaling. And then like, you know, one month you have, you know, 30 sales calls or whatever. And, you know, the whole sales team is like defeated and depressed and then they go quit and then you got to hire new people and SDR is like, I can't, you know, do this. And so, yeah, pros and cons to both. 
all the pains, man, all the pains. I see it in your eyes. I see it. <laughs> 500 people hired <laughs> remaining. Um, yeah. Super cool. Man. Super cool. So like for you, um, are you guys pushing, um, are you guys running like a, a book call? Click on the sad watch VSL book call. Like, is that, is, is, is that the big campaign for you guys? Yeah, we run an opt-in VSL funnel, VSL gotcha. call funnel. Yep. Gotcha. And so that's the majority of your, let's say book calls are coming from something of that nature for the most yep. part. Yep. Nice. And nice. we just recently are beginning to work on other funnel types, but like, once again, the focus thing, it's like, we ran that VSL funnel for three years. You know, it's like, we've changed the VSL out, you know, a couple of times, twice, maybe. Um, and then we haven't like split test the headline, you know, it's like, we haven't changed the pictures out. We haven't done any of that shit. It's like, once you have it working, it's like, just continue to drive it, you know? Let's fucking go, man. That's awesome. Yeah. And so, um, and, and, and in terms of like what a great VSL is, uh, I, I got many questions here, man. So one would be like, what's a great, uh, duration, um, to what are some like big keys? Cause I, I've done a 45 minute webinar. Um, I'm, and right now I'm, I'm building like a 15 minute VSL, which is very quick to the point, uh, very testimonial driven and just, uh, I wouldn't say testimonial driven, just like, just like right to the point. So, um, from your two cents after running millions of dollars to VSLs, what's the biggest thing for you in the VSL that gets people to, uh, truly really rock and roll? Um, so, you know, I think that it's hard, like to, uh, answer that like ahead of time. Like, I think like you just got to test a little bit on your VSL. Obviously you have to get, get a good hook, but like the market now in like these markets, and then especially if like you're in a younger generation, um, then, you know, I think it really has much more to do with, do you have a really, really strong sales argument? And then do you have a really valuable thing? Right. And then like, can you display that on video? Like if you boil it down. So I think those things are the North star much more than like a length or much more than like a style or much more of like a, like, if you look at like pace Morby, you know, he's crunching massive, massive numbers on his webinars and he's not following any sort of webinar like structure, right? Like lead in any of that. And that's because he has a very valuable offer that he dominates the market in, right? He builds up all this evidence before the point of the VSL with all of his free stuff that's out there. And then, you know, then you just, he's just talking, you know what I mean? Like he's just expressing uh, something. And then what I believe that is, is a very strong sales argument that has a lot of value, you know? So I think those are the two most important things. Then if you're talking about like functional stuff, it's like, you know, the hook, right? Like you got to make sure that you're like getting people into the topic and like engaged with the video. Um, and then like from an editing standpoint, you know, you want to keep people's attention and things like that. But I think that that's a much harder game to play than just focusing on the first part the the, the true North star, which is like really strong sales argument and then very valuable, um, very valuable stuff. Yeah. I love that perspective. Sales argument. That's a, it's an interesting thing. I, I haven't heard it said like that. I love that. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. That's awesome, man. And so, yeah, I think for a lot of people watching, man, this is, this is the game to play. I think building a VSL can be tough, but when I look at a VSL, um, I look at something that is a premium piece of content that can be replayed over and over and it becomes a money machine once you crack the code rather than being the person. Cause I think a lot of people look at these people who are very successful. They're like, Oh, they're posting reels all the time. Look, they're, they're posting all this content and their stories, but it's like, what is really driving the numbers to scale is having a great paid traffic source to a great sales argument video. And so yep. I love that, man. I love that. So um, I got a few more, a few more questions. I, I really appreciate your time. Um, if you guys are loving this comment down below, show, show Luke some love, man. Um, and so one, what is, what is, what, what is the play for Luke over the next three to five years? So for example, uh, you're obviously in the coaching space. You could be in the physical e-com space. Obviously, you have a background in that. You could be in the software space uh, down the road. But what is what is your play long term? Is it to double down and just keep growing the coaching? Is it is it starting some type of 
physical product venture that aligns with, uh, with warrior babe. Um, yeah. What's the play, man? Yes. Uh, so warrior babe, I think you get a lot bigger, so we're going to keep pushing that, um, you know, health and fitness is an important thing. And then we're now in a good position in the market where we can, you know, attract a lot of the top talent to work with us. So like the best coaches and stuff like that. And that makes our offer, you know, valuable. And then, uh, you know, we, uh, we do a good job there. You know, we have like good, good systems and things in place just because how long we've been doing it. So we're going to keep, keep pushing it. Um, and you know, I don't see a near limit. We were stuck at a million a month for like 24 months, uh, roughly a million a month, some over some under. And then just recently we, are growing, you know, we're growing. We had a, we had a big hire basically come in internal sales, big hire. And, uh, that's changed our ability to scale the sales team. And so, and now we, we can hire salespeople, we can hire coaches. Um, you know, we're hiring, we're doing group interviews with like 20 salespeople a week and then 20 coaches a week right now, roughly. Um, and so, yeah, we're going to keep pushing that. And then there is like a software play ar around it as well. Um, that not necessarily would be the same company or business, but that's something that I'm thinking of as well. Yeah, do see, I, I, you know what, like I now get it because once you start hitting a million a month, you have to have coaches on demand. Like I think the first play is you build a group coaching model where people can jump on. You have weekly group calls. And then you have some accountability on the side. But once you guys are hitting a million a month, I, I don't know what the product costs. Are you guys selling, is, is it a 12 week? It's like, five, it's like 500 bucks a month. So 500 so, bucks a month. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, go ahead. So we try and get them to pay for the full year, which is six grand. They can do a quarter. They can do six months. They can do full year. And it averages about 500 bucks a month. So where, where are things a little, not different? It's like the coaches, like that's their full jobs. You know, so like coaches come in and then like, you know, we pay them per client that they coach. Uh, and then we have all of our systems and things like that, that they can plug into, to do the job well, but like, that's their full job, you know? So they're, they're like leaving whatever job that they're doing. And then we're paying them, you know, full-time income, um, coaching. Damn. Yeah. So you're not, so you wouldn't even say your product is high ticket. Like it is high ticket in terms of they're paying whatever six grand for the year, or I'm, guess, I'm guessing you're giving a discount if they pay for the full year, right? Because 500 times 12 is 6,000. Yeah. So I'm guessing whatever that would look like, but you're basically selling a $500 a month coaching program. And are they, are they locked in for three months or is it just month to month? They're locked in. We want them. They're locked in for three months. Yeah. So depending on what they choose. It's 1500 bucks per sale. Yeah. Depending if we either do a quarter, which is two grand. So it's, it's two grand for a quarter or 3,500 for six months or 6,000 for the year. That's solid. That's mm -hmm. solid. And so that's great, man. And so is the, uh, again, is the play to sell the company long-term and to build it in a way where you're not needed or do you always want to feel needed? I'm, I'm, I'm totally kidding. <laughs> No, um, definitely want to feel needed. Doesn't necessarily have to be. Doesn't necessarily have to be in this company. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. No, I mean, I would say like, like, like there was like, yeah, after twenty twenty one and twenty twenty two, I, um, you know, I was not needed. You know, I was not <laughs> needed awesome. much. So, um, you know, now I'm trying to push it up to the next level, so I'm needed again. Um, and, uh, <laughs> and. Uh, yeah. You know, I don't know. We're just going to keep pushing it. And like, yeah, we're, we're, we're considering these things. Like the software play is more of like a sell play, mm. um, which I actually have a meeting right after this. I, I'm going to buy it. I'm going to, if I do it, I'm going to try and buy a software business that's already established. That's like in a certain piece of what we want to do. And then we would, it would, help our company because the current products out there aren't that good if we could guide it. And then we know enough because we have a big enough customer and coach base. They say, Hey, here's what's important for this specific thing. And then, um, you know, I'll tack on everything that we have behind the scenes that helps us build the actual business. So then it'd be like a, 
a software that like a coach could come in that's fitness specific um, and then have like all of the things that we use to do the whole damn thing all in one spot. So that's like, that'd be like the, the real, real North star of it. And that would be for the cell play. I love the way you think, bro. I so, you, so yeah, I love the way you think, man. This is, this is why I do these, I do these podcasts very selfishly and I, I rarely do podcasts, but this is, this is being selfish. Good, man. Good. Um, <laughs> um, yeah. And so, and so the idea for you is, are, are you, are you not a fan of like super high ticket, like selling a program for 10,000 or are you, or are you more, cause I, I see more of a, a mass offer, right? So well, for example, I think you, it all is kind of arbitrary. You know, if it's like, if you're in biz op, then you're in biz op, right? And it's like, you can justify bigger payments because you have ROI justification. You know, it's like, hey, if you spend 20, but you're going to make 50, that's a lot easier than like, hey, we're going to, you know, help you work out and diet and eat right for a year. So like, mm-hmm. I think markets have like acceptable prices and, you know, we're all, we are mass market, right? So it's like, where where's the line where you can sell it for? And then, you know, and then what do you want to sell it for? You know, it's like, so it's like, I feel like that's just kind of the sweet spot that we found and we're happy with. Um, And yeah, so that's where it is. But no, it's not like I'm like, oh, against more, you know, we've, we are actually trying to figure out a way to have a better one, but we're not one of these, you know, we're big enough and established enough company where it's like, we're not just like, oh, let's just, you know, let's just, you know try and sell it for more. It's like, no, we need to figure out, can we do blood testing? Can we do, you know, hormone stuff? Can we be an affiliate with whatever, get all the coaches certified to be able to read the blood? Or do we not want to do that? Because then we have more risk and let's just have it completely outsourced, but we can be like an affiliate to do something like that. So no, the price is like not something that I'm stuck on at all. Mm. It's more so like the market decides what the price is. And then like your offer decides how valuable the thing is. And if you're in a specific market with specific things, then it could be more expensive fitness and weight loss. It's mass market, you know, so yeah. that's the sweet spot here. But are, are you finding you have a lot of uh, people that will pay long-term? Like I, I, we, we, we don't have to go into churn rate, but I mean, the ideal ideal place to be in is where you have residuals or monthly where people are just paying every month. That's, that's, that's the goal for you. Yeah, and for so, sure. And so if you offer something great, then, then it all kind of connects. I love that, man. I love that. Yeah. Cool. For sure. Well, well to kind of wrap up, man, I, I really appreciate your time. You guys can give Luke some love down below. I think this is awesome. And I, I hope we connect again. Um, any plugs for yourself that people can go check out. I know you're the uh, podcast host, of the internet capitalist. Uh, mm-hmm. Is there any plugs specifically where they can follow you or learn more from you or just kind of understand more of what you think? Yeah. Right now, just at Luke Kish on Instagram. That's the best spot. i um, trying to get that going a little bit. And um, yeah, that's, that's the main spot right now. Yeah, dude. I appreciate it. Any last words from yourself, sir? No, I'm all good. Thank you for having me, dude. Appreciate yeah. the time. Yeah, this is awesome, man. Keep winning, bro. Likewise, if there's right, anything sir. I could do to help, DM anytime. I will. I'll, I'll be DMing you all the time now. Thank you so all much right. for that. All right. Sounds good. <laughs> yeah, see you later. Bye. Bye-bye.